Oh, Suzanne, if anyone is out there that can hear this, that has you, please, we'll do whatever it takes to bring you back. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. In true crime, context is everything. What do ashes in a fireplace mean? What is the significance of a trash dispenser in a public space, for example, by a bus stop? Why is a translucent test tube shaped plastic cap worth paying any attention to? And is a crack in the door frame leading into a bedroom important? Taken separately, taken individually, each of these may seem pretty flimsy, hardly even qualifying as evidence. Taken together though and intertextually, an ominous picture emerges. So in this episode we're going to look at six of the most shocking evidence photos that have recently been released in the Barry Morphew case. But before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do like, share, leave a comment. And let's get started. So, number one, I see fire. And these are images, it's People's Exhibit 83, 84. We see images of the fireplace, of the hearth, if you, if you like. And according to the authorities, this, the contents of the hearth were, how can I put it, they were, it appeared as though it had been recently used. And something that stuck out was a piece of wood that was not part of the kindling stack. There's a, I think there were two stacks of kindling and um, one was... A complete stack if I can put it that way and so there's no reason for this varnished piece of wood to be there and so the question is why was it there was there some residue or stain on that wood that it needed to be burned and then there were also I think documents that were that had been burned and other strange fragments and that are that you can see in people's evidence photo um, 84 it looks like it could be a card, um, and then there are also longish strands. Could, could those be shoelaces? One wonders what that actually is. There are also fibers of some kind to the left. Uh, one wonders what that's all about. Then that grill, that steel grill, was it always so deformed? Funnily enough, I was on holiday not that long ago, and... Uh, I've made a huge fire in a very sort of fairly contact fireplace and I, I, after it was cleaned out I noticed a dent in the back of the, the hearth and I thought that I had done that but it turned out it had been there all along so I thought I, I could have damaged it. The question is was this grill always so deformed or did he make a particularly big fire around the time Suzanne disappeared? Another possibility, of course, is that this grill was already somewhat deformed, but it's been significantly more deformed, um, you know, during the time that Suzanne disappeared. I think it's an interesting legal question. Now, you might say, well, I don't really find that really shocking. You know, if, if Barry burned something, it doesn't really mean anything. Well, take a moment. We're still going to go through the others. But the question isn't right now. It's not just how and why Suzanne Morphew disappeared, but how and why she disappeared without a trace. Does that make sense? The without a trace aspect suggests certain things were covered up, cleaned, and this is part important, and or destroyed. One easy way to destroy evidence inside the home is by using the hearth. Curiously, inside Barry's vehicle is gear that is it's difficult to say for sure what is going on there, but it's either stained with something or burned. It's possible if there were soot or smoke residues on Barry's clothing that that was what necessitated his initial explanation. You know, where were you when Suzanne went missing? You know, remember he said he was doing a volunteer firefighting course in Denver or something like that on the day Susan Suzanne disappeared. 
the fireman's hat may have been part of trying to make that alibi stick. And the fireman's hat might also be there to say, well, that's why there's some suit on my clothes, because that's where I was. So the hearth and the stuff that was burned in there, I don't know whether one can say that that stands alone. It does link up to exactly what Barry said about where he was, certainly in the beginning. It also appears as though the hearth in the home has recently been used. As I say, there's an unburned piece of wood still inside that doesn't match the wood pile. I think it's quite significant that that piece of wood didn't really burn properly. So everything else burns, but there's that piece of wood left over. So had that been put in right at the end? And what was that initially a part of? Uh, intertextually, we know that Chris Watts barbecued hours before his family disappeared. Remember, he cooked those uh, chicken pieces. And you might think, yeah, barbecue is not the same as a fire in a fireplace. Well, a fire is a fire. A fire was made during the period either very imminent to the crime or, um, you know, kind of in the same ballpark time-wise in the lead-up. So it's possible that Chris Watts also burned papers, receipts, even oxycodone vials, who knows. In the Ramsey home, the hearth could also have been used to burn duct tape, practice ransom note pages, and excess nylon cord. Are you getting a sense that the hearth could be more significant than you might have thought in the beginning? Number two, what is the key tool of the criminal trade? More and more, we see the tools of the true crime trade heavily involving vehicles and cell phones. A vehicle is one way to try to be in two places at once, a way to quickly get yourself away from where a crime was committed and be somewhere else. Oh, where were you when that happened? Oh, no, I was far away. Well, if you drove quickly in the middle of the night or early in the morning, as Chris Watts did, then it may seem that way. In the Chris Watts case, Watts implied that on the night or morning in question, he simply got in his vehicle and went to work just like any other day. But it wasn't like any other day. He didn't normally back his truck up. And I think that also applies to Barry Morphy. I think there's some evidence in the metadata in the movements of the vehicle and the doors opening that the truck was also kind of backed up onto the driver. I could be wrong. But generally speaking, Morphew seemed to be doing the same thing. He was up very early. Was it 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the morning? Um, you know, what would you be doing up that early on a Sunday morning? And that that really is part of the oddness of, you know, if you um, trying to present the defense case and saying, no, Barry is completely innocent. Okay, well, the odd thing is, why is he working on a Sunday where not even his employees were there or working. In fact, I think they were legally precluded from working on a Sunday because it's construction. So like Barry, Chris Watts also drove a Ford Super Duty. Chris Watts also transported his family far afield. I remember in that case thinking, had he dumped their bodies anywhere but the oil field, for example, in the Platte River, and the bodies were found, it would not necessarily have implicated him compared to dumping them at an access-controlled oil site. And one does wonder whether Barry Morphy was paying attention to the Chris Watts case and thinking, you know, you could have done this, you should have done that, you shouldn't have done X, Y, and Z, right? Bear in mind the Morphy case post-dates the Chris Watts case. Vehicles are also part of the true crime fabric in the O.J. Simpson case, Scott Peterson, Madeleine McCann, Jody Arias, Casey Anthony, Stephen Avery, Patrick Frazee, and Letitia Stork. It remains to be seen whether it's also part of the fabric in the Summer Wells case. I think it's becoming increasingly important when authorities are checking a crime scene to do a thorough check of the vehicle's owned by either the victim or the, the potential suspect. And that brings us to the third point, trash bags and taking out the trash. You might not think that this is shocking. You might think what is so upsetting or strange or ominous about 
a trash receptacle beside a bus stop. What is so strange about a guy taking out the trash or moving around bags outside a hotel? What is so odd about a man walking down a hotel corridor carrying a bag of something, oddly shaped bag with, with something in it, right? And it's quite interesting how much he's carrying there. It appears that whatever he's carrying is fairly heavy. It's not like a plastic bag with a, with a bag of crisps inside or, or, or chocolates or something. It looks like what he's carrying is fairly heavy. It's also interesting that he's carrying quite a lot, almost as if to say, well, don't look at... Um, it's almost to... Because he's carrying so much, you wouldn't know where to look kind of thing. But in this particular screen grab where you see Barry exiting the vehicle, uh, seems to move to the back side of it, um, disposes something of something at the side of the road gets back in Uh, i'm not sure if he does it twice or how many times he does it that's people's exhibit 40 that to me kind of makes me think a bit of the casey anthony case because that's exactly what happened with kaylee's remains they was literally left right beside the road similar with leticia stork and the gannon stork case and so you might say it's still not really shocking, but the what it implies is that these multiple disposal sites, and I haven't really dealt with many of them here, there are many more in these exhibits, but what it is implying is that a person is now reduced to something that can fit into a plastic bag. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? It's referring to possible dismemberment, as we saw in the Robert Durst case. That's what's shocking about it. And... We, we've we said before that Barry Morphew was a hunter. He was used to, it's a kind of a very euphemistic term for what it actually is, but cleaning or field dressing his um, uh, trophies, right? And one wonders whether something similar to that didn't take place here. So thus far, we've dealt with three aspects, making a fire very close to the time of the incident, getting in the car, and then busily driving around all over the place. And then in the context of those two things, also taking out the trash. In all three of these instances, we have perfect matches with the Chris Watts case and the Patrick Frazee case. Frazee, of course, made a huge fire and had his mistress remove five or six garbage bags full of stained rags from the crime scene. He also did plenty of driving around on the day in question. So the point is that you can have a little bit of erratic behavior. People are strange beings sometimes, but when you have a lot of strange behavior on the same day, and I think it's quite important to stress the following. You know, if Barry is taking out the garbage on a Sunday, you might think, He's actually a very clean guy. He's a very, he likes his home to be very clean and neat. Well, then why the mess inside the fireplace? Why, are, why is the clothing inside his vehicle so messy as well? Why would you go to so much effort to take out the garbage, but your own car is like a garbage dump? Then, and this, this is where it gets more and more interesting and ominous. Number four, there's an abandoned self-help book and an unclaimed handbag. And I want to just bring you back to what we're talking about is you have the situation where it's not just that Suzanne Morphy disappears. She disappears without a trace. And despite a long investigation and search, she's still not found. And so a cousin to that scenario of a person disappearing without a trace, you also have other things disappearing other materials disappearing, other things being thrown away. And then, in, again, in the context of that, certain things remain behind, such as a self-help book and a handbag. And I'm not going to talk too much about this except to say we know that Suzanne Morphy was clearly struggling in her marriage and her reading material reflected this. 
and it's an intertextuality with the Chris Watts case. There's also infidelity there. In the Watts case, the discarded reading material was a book called Hold Me Tight. Intertextually, once again, you have a woman disappearing while leaving her purse, credit cards, and cash behind, and then there's also the self-help book. And the self-help book is really an analogy for, okay, so your marriage is in trouble, how much trouble is it in? And typically when books are ordered, it tends to have passed a critical threshold. And is that the case in this particular case? The question really isn't whether you think it passed a critical threshold, it's whether Barry thought that. And did that really sink in on Mother's Day, that particular Mother's Day when his daughters were far away? Now we come to the fifth um, shocking image, and it's the broken doorway and the emergency laundry done. I think you kind of need to see these together, the sort of domestic thing going on. A door that is damaged doesn't necessarily mean someone has been murdered. Doing the laundry doesn't necessarily mean someone has just been murdered. But add these two dimensions to all of those already mentioned, and it suddenly starts to look very fishy indeed. Not only are you doing the laundry, you're taking out the garbage, it's on a Sunday, you're driving around, you've made a fire, all of these strange things take place at the same time. And within those circumstances, somebody goes missing and is never seen again. Other cases involving either broken doors or emergency laundry, or both, include Amanda Knox, Oscar Pistorius, Jody Arias, and Scott Peterson. And that brings us to the sixth and final image that I find particularly shocking, and it's really of Barry himself. You kind of get this, there's this strange unreality of, and you know, we don't know for, for a fact that Barry's responsible, but if he is, there's this strange reality of but potentially doing something absolutely almost inhuman. I, I don't know if, if it is almost, it, it's absolutely inhuman. And then wandering around and, you know, having possibly done something you still have the freedom of movement to walk around to live and breathe to go where you want to meanwhile it's just been a few minutes or hours since someone else has been permanently deprived of ordinary living amazing living everything that they're ever going to have has been stopped everything has been taken away and the other person is now free to do whatever they want and to say whatever they want about you, whatever. So you may not find these images disturbing. I definitely do. On a day when Barry could have done anything, he did whatever he did do. It's one thing to imagine a crime. It's another to actually see a person moving around and obviously doing what they're meant to do. And you know, in a situation like this, if Barry is guilty then the clock has started ticking on what is eventually going to happen. Either he's going to get away with it or he isn't. Both those prospects are pretty frightening. Obviously, it's also possible that Barry didn't do anything, but whether he did or didn't, he's now in the situation. The clock is starting to tick. The authorities are going to do the investigation. The stakes are going up. The stakes have immediately gone up greatly. The moment that Suzanne dies, the stakes shoot up. So one has to war wonder what, what is Barry actually thinking at this moment? Was he conscious that he was possibly being caught on CCTV? Was he caught up in a swirling vortex of emotion? Was he already having flashbacks of Suzanne's voice, the look in her eyes, the motions of her hand, other visceral um, kind of glimpses in a way, like short flashes in his memory. Speaking of which, was Barry walking and driving while feeling the sting of fresh cuts on his arms and hands? Intertextually, Chris Watts, Scott Peterson and Jody Aries all suffered fresh nicks to their hands. In Watts's case, it was to his neck. And to me, this is the most disturbing image of all. 
On Sunday, Barry Morphy alone, caught on camera, looking into the camera. It seems as though he's either looking into the camera or just off camera. It's another version of the Trinastich video, and that's clearly another dimension to true crime these days as well. Patrick Frazee was also caught on various CCTV cameras, the T-shirt stalk as well, and Gabby and Brian Laundrie's movements were captured by YouTubers and TikTokers. And now Barry Morphew. Did he not think or did he not know that wherever he went, there were cameras watching? Yes, even on a Sunday. Some have said that Barry is carrying something that appears to be heavy. I think he could be carrying tools in it. It's a possibility. But remember, Chris Watts claimed the heavy tools he was loading into his truck on the night in question were also tools. If he wasn't carrying tools, what was he carrying? And why did witnesses say the room smelled strongly of chlorine? Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time.